Welcome to our third lecture on the Family and Medical Leave Act. In our first two lectures, we talked about um, which employers have to comply with the Family and Medical Leave Act, which employees are eligible for the benefits of the FMLA, what reasons can qualify a person for a family and medical leave, and in this analysis, we didn't really cover the military situation. In our second lecture, we talked about um, how to calculate the amount of leave that a person is entitled to. And we discussed employer rights and responsibilities with respect to the FMLA. Now, in this presentation, we're going to talk about the remaining topics, um, the employee's responsibilities and his uh, or her rights under the statute, the particular protections available to military families under the Family and Medical Leave Act, and then finally, we'll discuss USERA, which stands for the Uniform Services Employment and Reemployment Rights Act. So let's begin. I'm going to advance to the place that we were at during the end, at the end of our last lecture. And here we go. So we're ready to pick up on employee rights and responsibilities. So when an employee has an FMLA event, it's very likely that the employee isn't even thinking about FMLA. I mean, sometimes they are, but many times they aren't, especially when it's not kind of a catastrophic event. Um, but despite the fact that they may not have it on the radar, if they want to reap the benefits of the statute, it's a good idea for them to take these actions. Now, before we go too much into these, I want to give a bit of a disclaimer from the perspective of the employer. Um, it's very difficult for the employer to prove that the employee hasn't done some of these things because, of course, it becomes a he said, she said situation. The employee now claims, well, I told my supervisor this, and the supervisor says, no, you didn't. And then there's a debate or there's a, an issue that needs to be resolved. Um, it's a pretty challenging thing to disprove when an employee is willing to say that he or she said a certain thing. So an employer shouldn't take these employee responsibilities to mean, oh, well, the employee didn't do what the employee was supposed to do, so we don't have to do what we're ordinarily supposed to do. I would encourage you to err on the side of a bit of forgiveness when the employee makes an error in this area, in part because many times these employees are under a lot of stress. Um, because of the medical situation that they're confronting. So it's kind of the humane and reasonable thing to do. But from a cold calculating perspective, it also makes sense in that uh, if they didn't dot the I and cross the T exactly, uh, it's very likely that there will be some forgiveness offered. So don't get too, taught, don't get too uh, focused on these requirements <clears throat> because they may not be as required as, as we might think at first. So uh, the one thing that the employee has to do is provide sufficient and timely notice of the need for the leave. And again, the employee doesn't have to say any particular word, doesn't have to mention family and medical leave, doesn't have to mention the word leave. And what qualifies as sufficient and timely notice is going to depend upon the circumstances. If I have a heart attack, guess what? I didn't know I was going to have the heart attack until I, you know, had the heart attack. If I knew, okay, I'm going to have a heart attack in five hours, I would, you know, get to the emergency room, right? Um, and so that's just not the way certain illnesses happen. I don't know when I'm going to be in that serious car accident. Many of the conditions that require FMLA happen without a lot of warning. Now, some do have a lot of warning. For example, you know, you don't suddenly know, suddenly deliver a baby without any advance notice. Um, you also, uh, oftentimes before you're having some major surgery, you have some time to prepare for that. It may just be a few days or it may sometimes be a few weeks. And so under those circumstances, when the employee does have the advance notice, he or she should be telling the employee. So if the employer, once the employee gives this notice to the employer, the employer may request certification. We'll talk more about that in a few minutes. If the employer requests it, then the employee needs to provide it. There may also be the need for periodic status updates. And also possibly when the employee is ready to return to work, a fitness for duty certification. Um, I would say, though, that the second categories are usually not going to be big deals. It's usually going to be this one that is going to be the greater focus of attention. 
So when the leave is foreseeable, the employee should give 30 days notice. Now again, let's imagine you have an employee who's expecting a baby. They, you know, they, maybe there's been a, a baby shower, maybe there's been some jokes about what are you gonna name the baby or are you having twins or that kind of stuff. But the employee has never formally come to you and said, I'm expecting a baby and I expect to deliver this baby on this date and I will need at least six weeks to recover. Um, but you know what? You know, <laughs> you know that somebody that pregnant is going to give birth. And so uh, don't get so caught up on, well, he, she didn't actually give me this official statement that she's going to actually give birth. Well, guess what? You know how this process works. This isn't a strange or new, new thing. So uh, when it's foreseeable, you need to give 30 days notice, but many times the circumstances will present itself. Um, that, that it's obvious under the circumstances that this particular situation is going to come up. Also, again, as soon as practicable when it's an unforeseen situation. Let's talk about the uh, certification forms that you might be using. The first thing to notice about this is that these are optional forms. Employers don't have to use them. And in fact, I would encourage you, uh, your employer not to use these particular forms uh, because they have the Department of Labor on them. And it sounds, or it may confuse the employee. Do I submit this Department of Labor? Do I submit it to the employer? Um, it may also make the employee think, oh, maybe this employer's in trouble that he's using these forms from the Department of Labor or something along those lines. So I would encourage an employer to go ahead and customize them at least to some extent. Having said that, these forms actually cover all of the things required by the statute. So they're a very handy starting place for this process. Let's uh, look at these forms. So these are forms that we're going to use. One is going to be when the employee, I think the E is the employee case, when the employee has a serious health condition, this is when the family member has a serious health condition. So let's look at these forms just for a second so you get a flavor for these. By the way, I've posted these in the um, module for this course. So here we have, this is for the family, actually let's look at for the uh, employee serious health condition. And you can see that this is completed by the employer, so it's giving the employer name and contact information. And then this completed by the employee, this is the release so that the employee, uh, the empo doctor is gonna feel comfortable filling out their form. And then you can see there's some information about the doctor's office and then here's the medical facts. So this is the most important part. When did the illness begin? How long will it last? Um, and then this is with respect to that inpatient. You remember there's the two categories, continuing uh, and then inpatient. So this is it, do, do, do we fit into the inpatient category? And um, then we have, um, this is the, the three plus day category. Um, and this is an example of what might have been a treatment option for that second visit. Um, then we have pregnancy is another category. And then we have um, nothing particular about um, the chronic or continuing, but again, with, these, with this discussion, you get at those chronic or continuing issues. And then we see how much time is going to be needed and what kind of follow-up appointments might be necessary and um, are there going to be flare-ups that are going to have to be addressed and then here's some information about the predictability of these types of things and you can see there's an opportunity for the doctor to discuss it in more detail you can see this is a pretty burdensome process for the doctor oh actually before i go into this let me just flip over and show you the other form uh, the family form and it's very similar again you have the uh, section for the employer section for the employee section for the health care provider now some health care providers are going to require something from the family member indicating that he that the family member the one who's actually ill has consented to this process but the questions are largely the same because the definition of serious health condition is the same whether it's the family member or the employee who's experiencing the, the medical circumstance. Okay, so uh, because the doctor's office has to complete it, and it's not something that can be done in five minutes, it's not unusual for doctor's offices to charge a fee. Um, I've seen 25, I've seen 35 dollars, 
And this isn't going to be something that the insurance is going to pick up. The employee is going to have to pay for this. It's something that the employee will have to negotiate be between himself or herself in the doctor's office. It isn't the responsibility of the employer to pay for this. Because of the, the cost factor, it's not unusual for employees to say, well, I'm not going to complete the form. Let's say you have an employee who's just had bronchitis, not any big deal illness. And so he or she really doesn't need FMLA for this. He or she isn't any kind of attendance issue. Um, if, you, if the employer says, well, you've got to fill out the, the FMLA form and the employee says, I don't want to pay 25 bucks for that. That's what my doctor requires. Well, then under those circumstances, um, then the FMLA can be denied because the employee hasn't submitted the paperwork. So this can be a way for an employer to kind of sort through the trivial FMLA situations and the not so trivial. But this is going to require that the employer actually require the certification form. In my experience, most employers aren't that um, focused on this, aren't that kind of Johnny on the spot, giving out these forms and making sure that they are required part of the process. That does require kind of an attention to detail and a focus on this issue that frankly an employer may decide just isn't worth the effort. But if an employer does decide, yep, we want to really focus on this. Whenever we have somebody who is potentially FMLA eligible, we're going to require this form. We need to be consistent. You can't, you know, only uh, require these forms of, you know, the African-American employees or the male employees or the older employees. You need to be consistent about how this is handled. Um, now, of course, you don't have to follow the, the medical certification if the employee isn't experiencing an FMLA event. And that would mean, for example, employees during their first year of service. They may have something that would ordinarily be an FMLA event, but they themselves are not eligible, so it's not an FMLA event. Or it could be something, you know, truly trivial, like, oh, Bob went in to get his arm x-rayed. It wasn't even broken. It was just strained. He took a couple of hours off work and iced it down, and he's good as new. He's sore, but he can come back to work. Well, that wouldn't be an FMLA event under those circumstances. And so there wouldn't be any need to have the medical certification. Bob, under those circumstances, wouldn't be eligible for FMLA protection. Now, of course, it could be if it were a work-related incident, then you have workers' compensation protections. So let's say there's something about the form that is unclear. Sometimes it's just a matter of messy handwriting. Sometimes it's that the doctor has been very cagey and, and hasn't really answered the questions or has, been, uh, has left large sections of it blank. Under those circumstances, the employer can go back to the doctor and request information but the employer should not send the supervisor to do that. Um, if the employer happens to have a medical director or medical officer, such as a doctor or a nurse or some other medical uh, uh, expert, uh, then that would be the appropriate person to contact the doctor's office. Um, if the employer doesn't have that, then it's a good idea to have someone from HR do it. And again, here, the, you can't really challenge what the doctor says, but what you can do is you can um, make sure that the doctor, in fact, did provide it. This isn't a forged document. Uh, one way of authenticating that is to fax it to the doctor or to you know, scan it and email it to the doctor and say, please confirm that this is your signature. Um, another thing, again, could be clarifying what was meant. Maybe there's blanks, you know, what should go here? or I can't read your handwriting here. But you can't go and ask questions beyond what is provided in, in the information, uh, you know, the, you know the, what is required on the certification form. It is possible for an employer to request second and third opinions. Now the law provides for that opportunity, but I think it's rare for an employer to take advantage of it. The reasons are several. Once a doctor has provided a first opinion, um, yes, the employer can request a second opinion, but it's going to be at the employer's own expense. Um, if the uh, employer's uh, own doctor agrees with the first doctor, then it's done. The, 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 the evaluation of the first doctor is what's going to control. So the employer has now kind of gone to the expense and the hassle of having the second doctor evaluate, and the employer has just really confirmed what the employee had told him or her. But let's say that the employer does hire the second doctor, 
uh, and pays for the second doctor, has the evaluation, the second doctor disagrees. No, it's really not that, it's something else, or maybe it's nothing at all. Well, now the employer has to hire the tie-breaking doctor, the one that will decide whether Dr. A was correct or Dr. B is correct. Um, it could be that that third doctor is gonna agree with the employee's doctor. And it could be that the third doctor is gonna agree with the employer's doctor. If the uh, third doctor agrees with the employer's doctor, then of course the, the, there's two against one and the FMLA won't be approved. But think about it for a second. You have gone to a significant amount of hassle and expense simply to deny an unpaid leave of absence. Um, I would suggest doing that only in really, really unusual situations where you really think that there is some kind of scam going on where this person really isn't sick and maybe has um, some doctor kind of in cahoots with him or her. So, uh, you know, yes, it is an option, but it's uh, probably not one that's very appealing in most cases. And I think the, the, the writers of the statute wrote it in this way to uh, not make it very appealing to the employer to take advantage of this. Um, it is possible uh, to require that the employee have his conditions recertified. Um, and again, that this is an option and it makes sense when the uh, illness is going to be ongoing and might be the type of illness that could resolve itself. Um, for example, somebody might have uh, mono. Mono can be an, an illness that goes on for months or it could resolve itself sooner. And so you can see that it might make sense to have recertification from time to time. Um, it wouldn't make sense to recertify um, an illness such as migraines, for example, which will likely be a condition that the particular patient uh, confronts for, for a significant period of time. If you decide to recertify or request recertification, be sure before you do that to go through the regs and make sure that you're doing it in the right way at the right time. Um, if an employee is going to be out for a significant period of time, it, it's a good practice for the employee to maintain regular contact with the employer. An email once a week or a telephone call. Hey, just want to let you know, da 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 da. You don't have to give an update about the health, but you can say, look, I still intend to come back. I hope everyone's well at work. I'm excited about coming back on this date, that type of thing. If the employee isn't maintaining regular contact and it's a good idea for the employer to do so, please let me know. Are you still planning on coming back? We want to make sure that you know, we know when to expect you, that type of thing. So when the employee is ready to come back, the employer does have the option of requiring a fitness for duty certification. Um, this is um, something that if you do for one employee, you ought to do it for all employees in that particular job class. I would say generally this is not a good idea because um, uh, it's, um, so again, you have to have it uni uniformly applied across the, the, the board um, because it's just a, 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 a something that really isn't going to accomplish a lot, except perhaps if you have a working environment that is very physical. And so you are genuinely concerned that maybe this will result in a workers' compensation um, event. Probably the times you would be interested in a fitness for duty certification are the times you can't really ask for it. And that's when somebody is requesting some kind of intermittent or reduced schedule leave. Um, so th th that's the situation where probably more often than not people are like, I'm not sure if this is really something we want to get involved with. Is this person really able to work? Is this working situation going to make sense? Now, it is true that the employee is going to be responsible for paying for it. So I suppose an employer could approach and say, well, this could be a yet another uh, reason or yet another uh, a, a step that the employer can take to kind of control the use or possibly the abuse of FMLA. But keep in mind, this is at the conclusion of the FMLA. And so I don't think it's likely to be the type of, of barrier that would cause an employee not to choose FMLA. They've already taken the FMLA time and now they're about ready to return to work. So we've talked about the employee rights and responsibilities. Again, if you're the employee taking advantage of the FMLA program, it makes sense to be aware of these. But if you're the employer running the program, keep in mind that these requirements, uh, you know, do exist, but um, 
also keep in mind that that um, the employer needs to to be be telling the employee you've got to fill out this form you've got to do this you've got to do that and the employer has has the greater responsibilities in this area than the employee so let's talk about um, the uh, FM, FMLA military aspects. This was not initially part of the law. Um, there are two responsibilities that employers have with respect to military FMLA leave. And because uh, there's two categories. One is qualifying exi exi exigency leave. I never can say that word right. And military caregiver leave. These are really two different programs that we're going to call the military family leave. And we're going to kind of talk about the first one in, in more detail. And then we'll talk about the second one in more detail. So the first one has to do with um, a situation in which a, a, an employee is uh, being, uh, well, uh, or I'm sorry, not the employee, but, but a family member of the employee is being called up for active duty. And sometimes when this happens, because the, that employee's family member, we'll say spouse, just to make it simple, but it's not restricted to spouse. So we'll say um, that your employee is a female, she's married to a male, the male has been called up to active duty, maybe he's being sent to Germany or Afghanistan or who knows where. And so this has caused her to essentially become a single parent for some period of time. And there are lots of things that are going to have to change in that period of time. Child care arrangements may need to be made. Um, there may need to be uh, wills drawn up. Um, other factors need to be uh, considered and taken care of. There may need to be some counseling involved so that the family can handle the changes that are happening into the family. And so lots of different things play a role in this situation, and that's why we have this particular type of leave. This 12 weeks of, of leave is going to come from the same bucket that we have our usual FMLA bucket. So let's say this particular employee, this wife in this case, uh, gave birth to a child six months earlier in the same, um, let's say the employer uses a rolling calendar. So it's, it's uh, and she used all 12 of her weeks uh, for uh, recovering from childbirth and well baby care. Well, guess what? She doesn't have any time in her bucket for exigency leave. Um, so this, for her, is zero weeks that she has available. Now, uh, I think a smart employer is going to work with somebody in this situation, um, but it's not going to fit under the uh, FMLA category. So if the um, employee's son or daughter is the one who is being called up for this military leave, uh, the son or daughter is obviously going to be over the age of 18. And remember, we had a definition for son and daughter under the medical part of the Family Medical Leave Act that said, well, once a child reaches the 18th birthday, unless he or she is incapable of self-care, then that child is no longer eligible, she's no longer considered a family member for the purposes of the parent taking time off to care for that child. The child's a grown up, and so the child kind of needs to fend for himself, I guess. But in this, in this part of the FMLA, the, the adult child is still considered a child, so the definition has changed. Uh, it could be a situation in which maybe uh, the daughter is an adult, is a single parent, has two children, she's been called up, for some type of military duty, and she needs somebody to take care of her children, um, your grandchildren, the the, the parents' grand or the you know the, the parent of the the, mil the military service members' uh, children, and so uh, obviously the uh, the parents of the daughter are going to need to uh, maybe pick up the children, um, put the children in new schools or daycares and you know have some time kind of helping the children adjust to this new situation that's not going to happen in a weekend there's just too many moving pieces to get that resolved and so um, under those circumstances that would be covered assuming of course that the uh, employee still has time in his or her fmla bucket okay we'll talk about what particularly is covered in this category of exigency leave in a couple of minutes Let's look at the qualifying exigency certification. Again, this is one that the DOL has provided. It's, I think, a good one, but you're gonna to wanna to customize it. You're not gonna to wanna to use exactly this format. Here is the exigency form. 
And again, the type of information you're going to want to carve out is you're not going to want to have this type of information on it. Um, you're also not going to want to have this kind of information on it down here at the bottom. And there's probably some other spots where you might say, eh, maybe we don't need to have that on there. But uh, the meat of it is going to be good. And you can see we have the same type of information. The employer fills this out. The employee fills out this information. You're going to attach the, the, the family member who's a military member, um, the, the actual copy of the orders here. And then you're going to explain the reason why you need to have this leave and the amount of time that you need. And then the signature of the employee. So again, you don't have to use this form, but the type of information you would need would be listed here. The employer can confirm the information. For example, confirm the orders, make sure that they are legitimate. Um, here we have some information about what types of active duty are covered. Again, this is something you're going to maybe need to dwell, drill down into when you actually are confronted with the situation. It doesn't make sense to memorize all these categories at this time. Just be aware that obviously this is defined in the regulations and statute. So here's some examples of those exigencies that might cause a person to need to take time off. Maybe a short notice deployment. Maybe a person um, didn't know that they were going to be going to Afghanistan in five days. Well, they've got to, um, you know, find a place to store their stuff. They've got to move the kids to this new daycare. They've got to close out that bank account. All of those things. Find a place for their dog, you know, and cat to, to live. Those types of things. There may be some military events, some training, some uh, parades. Who knows all those kind of things that might happen. Need to make alternative arrangements for childcare and school activities. If it's family is going from two parents to one parent, maybe the parent who is being deployed might be the one that used to pick up the kid after school. Well, now we're going to have to enroll the child in some kind of after school program. There may need to be some kind of financial meetings about how you're going to handle uh, these responsibilities or maybe some legal arrangements, maybe child custody issues if those are in play, maybe. Um, powers of attorney, maybe wills, things along those lines, some kind of counseling uh, uh, to, to help the individuals kind of cope with these changes. All of these things are the type of things that um, would qualify as exigencies. So that's the first category that we talked about. Now we're going to talk about the second category. So we're going to talk about military caregiver leave. This one is pretty different. Um, it also is going to pull from that 12-week category that we saw earlier on for the, the medical and the family situation. But in this case, the employee has 26 weeks of leave to use. Um, uh, so the, the, the first uh, 12 will be just the ordinary FMLA, and then there'll be 14 on top of that. Now, if a particular uh, employee hadn't used any FMLA, then he or she can use the entire FMLA 26 weeks for the purposes of this particular event. So let's go and look at the requirements here. Um, so all the FMLA leave is limited to a combined total of 26 work weeks during the single 12-month period. So here, again, let's imagine that your employee took eight weeks off uh, to have cancer surgery earlier on in this year. So now she, she has four more weeks of typical FMLA leave. Um, but she has 18 weeks available for this category. Let's say that her husband uh, was badly injured during the deployment. And so she may want to take off all of the remaining time, the 18 weeks, to care for him. Um, now, she won't get more than her 12 weeks for her own serious health condition or for all of the other reasons. So the 26 weeks, the, the additional 14 weeks can just be used for this military caregiver leave. 
talk about who qualifies as a covered service member. But here's the definition that we care about. A serious health, serious injury or illness. This is again the category that is covered with this, a serious injury or illness. This is what gets this particular employee up from the 12 weeks that ordinarily he or she would have to the additional 14 weeks. Here's the definition. A serious injury or illness is one that was incurred by a service member in the line of, of duty on active duty or existed before the service member's active duty that was aggravated by service in the line of duty on active duty. So in other words, his or her deployment uh, is a very meaningful part in what has caused this problem to happen. So imagine that uh, Bob is, um, uh, he is called up to active duty and uh, he, um, before he gets on the uh, boat or the plane to go to his place, he has a couple of days off in the port city before he goes and he goes to a restaurant and he chokes on a bone or something and he needs surgery uh, and something along those lines. Well, that's just going to be that 12 week circumstance because it wasn't in the line of duty on active duty. Um, so uh, you have to kind of sort through to see, does it fit into this category? And so we have to meet this first one, either one of these two, and then we need to meet the second one, which is may cause a service member to be medically unfit to perform the duties of his or her office, grade, rank, or rating. And so this is um, uh, you know, something of, of a material nature. This isn't paper cut. This isn't something of, of, in, of relatively unimportance in the circumstance. It doesn't have to be, you know, coma or paralysis, but it needs to be something that he or she is not going to be able to do his or her job for that period of time. Um, so we have a form, <laughs> as you've probably seen. We have lots of forms. By the way, WH here stands for wage and hour. That's where we get that term. Let's go look at the 385 form. This is the certification for serious injur injury or illness of a current service member. And there's instructions about how to complete it. And then here's information about the employee, but of course the employee is not the service member. So then we need information about the service member. Then we need information about the care that that service member is going to need. And you can see there's different categories. Very seriously injured, seriously injured, injured. And you can see this is the language that we saw in this may cause the service member to be medically unfit to perform the duties of his or her office, grade, rank, or rating. And we see that same language here, and obviously these are more severe circumstances. Then it talks about, well, how is that family member needed? Yes, the, the, the service member is injured. Well, how does that implicate the family member? And then, of course, the doctor signs the form at the end. And obviously, this is usually going to be a doctor who is a member of that military, um, of, of that, type, that service group. These also apply to vets. Um, uh, an injury can, can, uh, can continue to be an issue with respect to somebody who is a veteran and not an active member of the service. One thing I forgot to mention, I apologize for this, is that we get one 12 month period per serious injury. So it's not that if, if I'm injured, it, it, let's say I'm this service member and I'm injured, maybe my injury is a catastrophic injury and I will always need care. Well, the employer is not required to give 24 weeks for that injury every year to my family member. It's just per injury. Now, if I have one injury one year, then I 
am unfortunate and have another injury, then um, my my family member will be able to get a second amount of the 24 weeks, but it's um, it's only the 24 weeks for that one injury. Oh, here we go. This is that thing. So single 12 month period per covered service member per injury. So if I have one injury, even if it's a catastrophic one, my, my um, uh, family member is just going to get the 26 weeks. Now, going forward, after that initial year, my, my family member may well be able to get 12 weeks every year for my serious health condition, assuming you know, that would be under the normal FMLA. So let's say again, it's my spouse. Let's say my spouse is a paraplegic as a result of the uh, injury that he experienced as an active duty uh, military person. So I, the, the uh, family member, could uh, uh, get 26 weeks that first year um, because of the injury. And then in subsequent years, I would be under the normal FMLA and would be entitled to 12 weeks a year. Let's talk about how the um, employee enforces his or her rights under the law. He or she can file a private lawsuit. This is different than what we've seen with the EOC because there is no need to file a, a charge with the wage and hour division. And when we talked about the EOC, I probably conveyed uh, that it's not a very aggressive agency. It doesn't, for one thing, have a lot of power. And number one and number two, it usually finds in favor of the employer. And even if it doesn't, it doesn't have a lot of teeth. Uh, the statute doesn't give it a lot of teeth and it's not that well funded. So it doesn't really have a lot of ability to litigate a lot of these courses. I'm going to be honest with you, most employers are not very intimidated by the EOC. The wage and hour division is a different creature. Um, both under the Fair Labor Standards Act and the Family Medical Leave Act, the wage and hour administration or division is much more aggressive and is much more likely to um, uh, be a, an aggressive advocate for employees. As a result, you'll see that employees use the complaint process with the wage and hour division uh, more frequently and employers ears do perk up more when they get a call or they get a letter from the wage and hour division because they're likely to find a more aggressive agency. Um, when an employee either files a complaint or a lawsuit, he or she can, or the, the, the uh, 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 court or the the agency can look back two years uh, to see if there has been a violation. Three years if the violation was willful. So you can see this law, this FMLA tracks with the FLSA um, law, which was also two years, three years of willful. And again, we have that same designation of willfulness that we saw in the FLSA. Having a willfulness finding is usually not very hard. If a, if a violation is found, more often than not, the violation will be held to be willful. So it's not a very hard threshold to get to willful. <coughs> Excuse me. Here are the elements that we have for this claim. <coughs> Excuse me. In an FMLA interference claim, the plaintiff must show, first of all, that he or she was eligible. We know these two requirements, 12 months, 1,250 hours that her employer was covered by FMLA. We have 50 employees within a 75 mile radius. And she experienced a qualifying event. So we have what I call the EER, employer, employee, and reason are all covered. <coughs> uh, she provided her employer with sufficient notice. Again, rarely a, really a problem. She had not exhausted her 12 weeks already. <laughs> but this is the one that shows the violation. She was denied or de delayed the leave. <coughs> That's where we see the violation. Most of the time, this is where the real activity is going to be. Okay, now we're ready for the other statute. So at this point, we've talked about FMLA. We've completed that discussion. Let me pause here and just give some summing up a little bit on this topic. FMLA is an incredibly complex statute. <coughs> Um, when I was uh, in private practice, um, I would do seminars on the FMLA, and my seminars would last for days. 
um, it is a very, very complex statute. And one of the, the most challenging things about it was diffusing all of the beliefs that people had about FMLA beforehand. So I would spend <coughs> a lot of time and I would go up in front of the room and I would say, this is how it works. What you think you know about it probably isn't what's true. People would nod at me and then I would quiz them on that. <coughs> and even after I've made the presentation, about how FMLA worked, I would then ask questions and these people were listening. They were, they were trying to pick it up, but oftentimes they still were having in their heads these other processes. So one of the takeaways I hope you'll, you'll, you'll get from this is when you encounter FMLA situations, don't assume that, that whatever you think is a common sense answer is necessarily the answer that <coughs> is, is, is the, the correct answer. Also, don't assume that what you think is true or what somebody has told you is true in this area is, in fact, how the system works. Be skeptical of your own level of knowledge. Go ahead and do some digging to find out what the right answer is. I'm going to throw some of my colleagues, some, some attorneys under the bus in this area and tell you that if you're dealing with an attorney who doesn't specialize in employment law, he or she could very easily not really get FMLA and may have some misconceptions of his or her own. Even employment attorneys who don't specialize in FMLA oftentimes don't have a robust understanding of the statute. So I'm going to tell you right now, ask tough questions and ask to see. Now, what's the basis of that or how did you reach that conclusion? Be a little skeptical in this area. Let's now turn to USERA, which is the Uniform Services Employment and Reemployment uh, Rights Act. The way I remember how to pronounce this one is I say the word you, you, and then Sarah, like the name Sarah. It doesn't help you spell it. It's kind of a weird spelling here, but that's how people pronounce it, you Sarah. Um, <clears throat> One S, two R's. Okay, so let's talk about this law. Now, I just said that FMLA is surprising, but of all the laws we cover, this is the most surprising. <clears throat> I can remember one time where I had, um, I was making presentations to a senior executive and, and lots of other people. And this senior executive honestly was a bit of a jerk. Uh, she thought she knew all the answers, and she did. She was a, a very smart woman, and she knew the answers pretty well. And so we had gone through several days of seminars, and as we had gone through, you know, Title VII and FLSA, she had routinely gotten the answers right, and I could tell that she had kind of developed this kind of, yeah, yeah, I got all this covered. Yeah, yeah, you're not telling me anything I didn't already know. That was her demeanor. Because she was a smart woman who had been in this industry for a long time. She really did know a pretty darn good amount of law. Well, we got to you, Sarah, and we started to do these same types of quizzes. I was sitting next to her, and she was kind of, I don't say mocking the press presenters at this point, but a little bit of mocking. And she would, you know, say in her breath what she thought the answer was going to be. Well, as, as I said before, she had gotten virtually all the answers right before. But in this section, I think she missed 100% of the questions. It was stunning to me how this very smart woman knew almost nothing about this, and yet she thought she knew a lot. And that's a very common, um, I think, experience people have with the statute because this statute doesn't work at all like other statutes in this area. So whatever your assumptions are, because you, you probably have a lot of assumptions at this point, you've probably drawn a lot of conclusions about how employment law works in the United States. And so you're probably going to take those paradigms that you've developed and kind of try to import them into the statute. That's a reasonable thing to do. That's how we all make our, our worldviews, but don't do it here because this is going to break your heart because you, Sarah, doesn't work like any of the other laws. When we go through this, hopefully this will make it clearer. But the big takeaway that I want you to have, you know, I mean, I hope, obviously you're going to have to learn the law for the sake of this, uh, the, the, the test that we'll have in this course. But six months from now, two years from now, honestly, you won't remember a lot of these specifics. What I want you to remember about you, Sarah, is I need to look it up. I can't trust common sense. 
I can't trust my memory. I need to assume I don't know what the answer is. And then I'm going to work from there. The reality is that we just don't have enough time in this class to really do a deep dive into you, Sarah. So I can't even cover all of the quirky, surprising facts about this. Um, I'm just here to kind of tell you there's a lot going on here. And so when an employee presents himself or herself and says, I think I'm entitled to this, you might think to yourself, uh, that doesn't make any sense. I don't think you are. Before you say those words, say, you know what? I need to look into that for you. Let me get back to you. And that's when you do the deep dive. And that's when you find out whether they're correct or whether they're not correct. And there's a pretty darn good chance if they're a military person that they're going to be correct. So let's go through. Here's a definition of you, Sarah. It is an extremely pro-employee law, much more pro-employee than any of the laws we've seen to date. Um, Employers should be very careful before they decide not to hire, reinstate, demote, or discharge a military employee. So USERA provides that employers may not discriminate against members of the military. No big surprise there. Why would we want to allow employers to do that? <clears throat> but So that's not surprising. Let's look at our next two bullets here, though. Generally, returning mil uh, veterans are entitled to reemployment following up to five years of cumulative absence for military service. So think about that. Bob gets deployed. He's your employee. He's worked for you for two weeks. <clears throat> he uh, shows you orders. He's being called up for military duty. He's a reservist. He needs to report in seven days. I mean, the guy's worked for you for two weeks. He can work for you for one more week, three weeks, you didn't even think he was that good. You were actually thinking maybe I ought to go ahead and, and let him go at the end of the probationary period because he's just not that good. Um, but you, you kind of think to yourself, hey, this is good news. He's leaving. You know, I'll never see him again. That's kind of a good news. So he gets deployed after three weeks of employment. You don't hear from him for five years. You wouldn't recognize this guy on the street. I mean, honestly, just not even... Um, he's not, he hasn't called you, he hasn't written to you, you haven't heard anything about this from, from Bob. <clears throat> Five years later, he knocks on your door, he says, I'm back. You're like, who are you and why are you here and what, what, what do you mean you're back? I'm back. I have completed my service and I'm ready to come back to work. Who are you again? Bob, I'm Bob. Remember I worked for you for three whole weeks and I'm ready to come back to work. You think to yourself, well, Okay, um, so Bob, you were a supervisor trainee, is that right? Yep, that's what I was. Well, okay, I'll put you into a supervisor trainee spot. Oh, no, no, actually, that's not what you need to do. You need to treat me as if I have been employed these last five years for you. And so the supervisor trainee program was just a year-long thing. After the end of that first year, I should have become a supervisor. And I see that most of your supervisors who've been here, who were supervisors for two or three years, became managers. <clears throat> um, and so I should be a manager. You just need to go ahead and make me a manager. But Bob, I mean, you haven't done the training program and you haven't been a supervisor. Uh, your military service has nothing to do with what you would have been doing for us. So you didn't learn anything that would be applicable. Guess what? Bob's right. You need to put Bob in the position that he would have been in if he had not had a break in employment. So you have to put him here. Crazy, right? That's the escalator principle. Employers must try to place returning vets into the position they would have likely attained. <clears throat> so um, that is how that situation works. So this is the escalator principle. Of course, the idea is just like an escalator carries you up to the top with no effort on Bob's part, the escalator carries Bob up to that position. Let's say though that the employer says, well, gosh, Bob, I mean, we don't have any open managerial positions. Bob says, well, you have seven current managers, right? Yeah, I do. Yeah, we have seven positions and seven people in those positions. Bob says, well, just fire one of them, right? I mean, I'll just take that job. You pick. Which one are you going to fire? 
well, gosh, I mean, they're all good. They, they all have more service than you do, Bob. Uh, they're hardworking. They're smart. They add to the bottom line. I mean, they didn't do anything wrong. Yeah, okay. So, I mean, so, so make an eighth position. We can't afford that. Uh, times are tough. Uh, we just don't have the budget for an eighth position. Okay, so fire one of them. Okay, so let's say you say, okay, well, I guess we'll fire Susan. We'll fire Susan. She's the most recent per, per person who's been promoted. She was promoted two years ago. Um, actually, she was hired the same time that Bob was into the training program. Uh, she was much more impressive from the very beginning than Bob was. Um, but Susan wasn't in the military. Susan is, doesn't have any rights under you, Sarah. And so, bless her heart, she's just out of luck. <laughs> she did nothing wrong in this scenario. And yet, uh, her employment can be ended to accommodate Bob in this situation. And so, as, as sad as that is for poor Susan, that's how it can work. Now, the employer can't, you know, decide, well, we're going to let Susan go because she's a woman and the other uh, six managers are men. So, I mean, the employer can't pick which one to fire based upon a protected characteristic such as race or religion or gender. Um, probably the better path would be either the most recently uh, uh, put into that position or maybe most recently hired or perhaps um, the position that uh, Bob would be the best fit for filling. I mean, maybe Bob uh, was being trained in a particular department for those first three weeks and so it might make sense to put him into uh, that managerial position. So you can see how there can be huge morale issues under these circumstances, um, but that's the way that the law is written, unfortunately, for Susan under these circumstances. So let's consider the failure to reinstate situation. What does the um, plaintiff have to prove? Well, she has to prove that the employer was informed, or in this case, we'll say Bob. So let's say you refuse to reinstate Bob under these circumstances. Bob will have to prove that the employer was informed that the employee needed to leave to fulfill military duties. In our example, Bob did give the employer um, orders. If Bob had just vanished without saying anything about the need for him to go into the to go into active duty, then uh, Bob would be uh, would not be able to prove that element. But of course, Bob's not going to say that. He's not going to say, "Oh, I didn't tell anybody about the military duty." He's going to say, "Yeah, I gave my orders. I don't know why they don't remember it. I think they're lying." But um, and, and another factor is even if you're sure Bob didn't tell anyone about it, I mean, how can you prove it? I mean, that was five years ago. Nobody quite remembers. Or maybe the person who might have accepted the document from Bob is no longer with the company. Um, so that can raise problems for the employer. The employer received an honorable discharge from the active military service. Usually not a difficult thing to, to get. The employee has made a timely request to be reinstated. This is usually going to be, the, the number of days varies depending upon how long the military service was, but the but Bob doesn't have to show up immediately upon the end of his service. And then, of course, this is the one that shows the employer malfeasance, which is the employer delayed reinstatement, denied reinstatement, or failed to fully reinstate by restoring the employee to the terms and conditions of employment that would have prevailed had the employee not left to engage in military service. In other words, the escalator principle. So that is an overview of um, USERA. Now let me go back and talk about another USERA topic. Uh, <clears throat> this is a more common one to come up. Uh, so you're interviewing a group of employee, or a group of applicants, and one of them will say, Sally, um, you're doing some some new hire uh, and you're going to do some training and Sally seems like a pretty decent candidate but she tells you that she has her two weeks of military service coming up and unfortunately they're going to happen during that busy time of the year let's say you're in retail for example and a lot of your sales are generated in the late November December period of time and it just so happens that she will need to fulfill her military service in early December 
or perhaps while you are going through the training process, which maybe occurs in October and early November, she's going to have to take her two weeks at that time. While she's a, a reasonable candidate, that time just doesn't work for you. So you say to her, listen, Sally, you'd be a good candidate, but you know, unfortunately through no fault of your own these times that you're ineligible to work just aren't going to work for us and so we're going to have to pass on you you don't have the option of saying that you have to work with the person under those circumstances you can't consider when their mili the military duties that they have might interfere with the, your business or training opportunities or things like that this is a common misstep that the employer makes under these circumstances Keep in mind that these um, uh, military folks uh, have uh, a pretty sophisticated understanding in many cases about what their rights are. They're actually uh, trained and it's appropriate that they're trained by, their, by the military about how they can protect their rights when they return to civilian life. And so they're rather sophisticated in this area. If they start saying, I think I'm entitled to this, you, I'm not saying you ought to assume that they're 100% correct, but there's a pretty darn good chance they will be correct. And there may well be, you may well get a call. Um, I've, I've gotten calls from what are oftentimes called ombudsmen, people within the military that will call up and say, hey, uh, it doesn't seem like you're following the law here. Uh, this is how it's supposed to work. You really do need to reinstate Sally or Bob or whatever. This is, you know, how, how this is supposed to proceed. Uh, you can't count on getting that call, but when you do, take it seriously because uh, many times that will be a helpful piece of information to make sure you don't fall out of noncompliance. So at this point, we have covered um, all of our FMLA topics, employer eligibility, employee eligibility, the qualifying reasons, that's what I call the EER. We've talked about how to calculate FMLA leave, what the employer needs to do, what the employee needs to do. So this is all the traditional FMLA. Then we talked about military FMLA, and then we talked about USERA, which isn't part of FMLA at all, but since it's a leave statute, it makes sense to kind of marry this together with the topic of FMLA. Let's do some recap of things to keep in mind in the, this area. Uh, so be aware that many managers will have misconceptions about USERA and FMLA. But like so often happens with misconceptions, they don't know they have them. They will think that they're doing the right thing. And many times they will be so sure about it, they won't even ask someone in HR because it's obvious that the person doesn't have the right to reinstate. But they've been gone for five years. It's ridiculous. They won't even think it's worthy of a call to you if you're the HR professional. So you have to educate that population. Maybe not so that they know the right answers, but so they know to call. So one approach might be, listen, if you ever have a worker who is called into military duty and comes back, before you say anything to them, let's talk. Just tell them, hey, welcome back. Thank you for your service. I'm going to have touch base with HR because I don't know what to do under these circumstances. So let me get back to you as soon as I can. And it is important that it be handled quickly. Similarly with FMLA, don't assume that your workers know when to contact you. Just let them know when you have one of these situations, call me. We'll walk you through it. Don't assume you know what to do. When issues do arise, recheck the rules. Don't rely upon your own memory in these areas because as I say, you've probably heard so many different things. Uh, the memories are going to get confused in your head. Um, plus, sometimes the rules change and so you want to be sure that you know the latest and greatest. One thing we haven't talked about are state FMLAs, and this is a, uh, an additional complication to a subject that's already pretty darn complicated. Um, the, uh, the, the state of Texas does not have a state FMLA, so that does make managing FMLA easier. But I'm going to talk just briefly about two states. Um, the state of Connecticut has its own FMLA, and the state of Wisconsin has its own FMLA. There's other states that do too, but these are interesting states from an FMLA compliance standpoint. I'm offering these to you not because I'm going to expect you to know them, but I want you to see how complicated these can get. The state of Connecticut actually gives 16 weeks of FMLA to, um, actually let's just do Connecticut. We'll just do Connecticut. We won't do Wisconsin. Uh, in Connecticut, the, the workers get 16 weeks of FMLA, but it's over a 24-month period. You might think, well, that's eight weeks a year, so that's actually less than the federal FMLA, so I don't really have to worry about it. 
Well, no, that's not how it works. So let's think of a scenario. So Bob has a heart attack. His doctor says he needs to take off 14 weeks um, to recover. Well, under the federal statute, he takes 12 weeks of FMLA. But he still needs two weeks off, and those two weeks would not be covered by FMLA. But he is in the state of Connecticut, so he actually has six weeks of FMLA, so he takes four of his, the Connecticut FMLA. So he takes 14 weeks of, we'll call it CFMLA. Obviously, it wouldn't actually be called that because the F stands for federal, but we'll just pretend that that makes sense. And Bob still has two weeks of the Connecticut FMLA available to him. So his job is protected. It wouldn't be protected because he has those two weeks under FMLA. So if, we were, if he were in Texas, for example, the employer would not have to keep his position open. And there might be some vulnerability under the Americans with Disabilities Act. But just under the FMLA statute, uh, the employer could fire him after the 12 weeks are up. But in Connecticut, no, can't fire him because he's he still actually has two weeks because, of course, he's only taking 14, but under the statute, he's entitled to 16. Okay, so now um, we go to uh, the next year. And unfortunately, Bob's really unlucky. And the next year, Bob um, breaks his leg. It's a bad break. And the doctor says um, that he's going to need to be off 10 weeks this year. Well, he gets, again, the FMLA entitlement because more than a year has passed. We'll say this is 13 months later. And so he's back to having 12 weeks of FMLA. He takes 10 of those weeks. So he still has two weeks of FMLA. So this is a protected absence. Now, under the Connecticut FMLA, he only has two weeks left. So he only has two protected weeks under the Connecticut statute because they do run concurrently. The FMLA and the Connecticut benefit will run the same time. So under the Connecticut statute, Bob isn't protected uh, after the second week of his broken leg injury. So you can see under the first illness, or the fir yeah, first illness, he's not protected under the federal statute. Under the second ish illness, he's not covered under the state statute. But under both illnesses, he's protected by some statute. And so under these circumstances, Bob actually gets 24 weeks of FMLA uh, uh, for the, during that 24-month period of time. So you have to coordinate the state benefit with the federal benefit and give the employee whatever is the better benefit. So it's a very complex, interesting uh, analysis, and that does add an extra layer of complication. In Texas, we don't have to worry about this, but in other states, it oftentimes is an area that you want to make sure there is compliance on. It can be quite tricky to do so. You want to make sure that you're keeping your handbook updated. If you have an online version, make sure that's consistent with what you have in the paper version. And of course, that you're having a poster that explains the FMLA compliance issues. You want to make sure that you, of course, talk about what type of calendaring system you're going to use. Are you going to use the uh, 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 the the uh, uh, you know, year system that starts January 1st, some kind of other fiscal year system, for example, or are you going to use that rolling system? Any of those approaches are fine. You just have to uh, designate that before the FMLA event happens. You want to make sure that you're offering FMLA when appropriate um, and that you're documenting all of the grants of FMLA that are granted or denied. Uh, when there's FMLA involved uh, for the for, to assist a service member, you want to be especially careful. The calculation becomes more complex, and the reasons for the leave are somewhat different. The definition of son and daughter, for example, is different, and there's a different definition for serious health condition. Actually, it's not used that term, but but the the the, the term that is used is a little different. It has a different meaning. Be very careful when you're taking disciplinary action for absenteeism, especially after the employee has had his or her first year anniversary. It raises all kinds of FMLA issues, workers' comp retaliation issues, and Americans with Disabilities Act issues. So it's a very careful process. Don't assume that a no-fault attendance policy is going to be okay. 
It really isn't anymore. Uh, uh, absences relating to illnesses um, are usually not going to be the types of things that can result in disciplinary action. And again, before you take any negative actions about returning military uh, employees, be sure to check carefully under USERA. Let me give you one more example about how, uh, one of the protections of USERA. So let's imagine that this particular military, returning military member um, has, was, was, up, was on active duty for a year, we'll say for 16 months. He's returned and um, he is back at work. He's not very good. Maybe he wasn't that good before, or maybe he's just not good now. Uh, you have all kinds of bases for dismissing him, and ordinarily you just say, hey, Bob's just not working out. Uh, but you know what? During that first year of return, when the person has worked at least a year, the employer, uh, the, the at will rules of employment don't apply. They just don't. It's statutory. You can only fire somebody when you have good cause to fire. And exactly what qualifies as good cause is, is an issue that, that uh, would have to be resolved by the courts. Certainly, if you have a situation where Bob is getting into fights or he's stealing stuff, that would be good cause. Uh, but if he's just not very productive or he isn't making the best decisions or he's difficult to work with, uh, those are much more difficult calls to make. And so you have to be aware that the at-will rules just don't apply during that first year of the return. There's a presumption in the law that if you fire somebody during their first year back, assuming again they, they were they were actively involved in military service for a year or more uh, during in, during that break of, of employment in that situation the assumption is that you're discriminating uh, against that person during that first year so you have to be very very careful under those circumstances I hope that this presentation has been helpful for you. It's been my pleasure to make it. As always, if you have questions about the material, please feel free to contact me. My email is cgroover at colin.edu. I'd love to hear from you. Or better yet, come by my office hours so we can talk in more detail or give me a call during my office hours so we can chat. Uh, thank you for your attention and I hope you have a wonderful day. Take care.